for those that may not know me, I'm Alexander Jabbardi, professor of uh, Persian language and literature here at OU. Uh, it's my great pleasure today um, to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Farzana Milani. Professor Milani is a professor in the Department of Middle Eastern and South Asian Languages and Cultures at the University of Virginia, where she has served as chair since 2010. She is also a professor in the Department of Wim Women, Gender, and Sexuality. I believe her talk today will, will span those, uh, those two fields. Um, she's published numerous books on the female poet Furu Tarok Saad and on women writers in Iran more generally. Um, some of her books, which are outside as well, um, include Veils and Words, The Emerging Voices of women, Iranian Women Writers, Words Not Swords, Iranian Women Writers and the Freedom of Movement, as well as collections of translations of the poetry of Furu Tarok Saad, poetry of Simin Behbahani, um, other works, dozens of scholarly articles, poetry <coughs> in Persian as well as English, um, I could go on at, at length, but Dr. Milani made me promise to keep her introduction short. Um, so I'll just add that um, she's also very well poised to, to bring us between or to, or to connect us from um, the, the wonderful talk we heard this morning from um, Dr. Fatima Keshavars about Omar Khayyam, um, pre-modern uh, Persian mathematician, scientist, poet, and thinker, into um, a modern poet, Farouk Farouk Saad, who is very deeply embedded in that classical tradition, but at the same time, in a way, like Khayyam, uh, a very independent thinker, a taboo breaker, certainly, in her own right, um, which I'm, I'm sure we'll hear more about. Um, so please join me in welcoming uh, Sir Farouk Saad. Thank you. Friends, I have kissed books all my life. It's no exaggeration to say that one of the happiest memories of my childhood is when my mother will gather her five children around her, will take a book of poetry in her hand, often often, will kiss it, put it on her eyes, say a prayer for the poet, and then read a random poem to her five children sitting around her in a circle. I think it is this love of poetry that has kept Iran and the Iranian culture alive for so many centuries. So I want to thank, first and foremost, four people who have put Iranian studies and the study of literature at Oklahoma University on the map of the world. Shukul Khanu Farzaneh, Azam Khanu Farzaneh, and the two Farzaneh uh, brothers. I salute you for what you're doing. I admire what you're doing. At a time when the humanities are really uh, being uh, downsized, to say the least, at many universities, it is thanks to people like them that the study of Persian is flourishing in this country. Four hours or even less, I have also had the great honor to get to know Khanume, Marjan Khanume, my colleagues, Khanume uh, Serafi Pur, Aray Dr. Marashi, Manata Khanum, who couldn't be here because she has a, she's teaching a course, and of course, Eskandar Khan, Dr. Jack Boyd. Uh, thank you for your impeccable hospitality. Thank you for inviting me. And of course, I want to thank you all for being here, for giving me this great honor to share with you a little bit of information on Furuk Farouk I have to tell you, I wrote my dissertation on Furuk Farouk Saad. Uh, that's centuries ago, almost. <laughs> um, 
I finished my dissertation in 1979 at UCLA. And I have to tell you, at the time, many people, my field was French literature. Many people thought that it was a big mistake to switch from Flaubert, uh, person I was going to write my dissertation on, to Fodor Sad. I remember one of my very revered uh, professors said, Farzane, nobody can pronounce your own name, <laughs> and now you've chosen a poet whose name is also as unpronounceable <laughs> as yours. <laughs> um, so many people thought it was a triple suicide, <laughs> a woman writing on another woman from a woman's perspective. But I'm glad to tell you, it was a turning point in my life, and I have not regretted it a minute. I listened to my heart, and the poetry of Fudu Farouk never disappointed me. So, um, if it's okay with you, and with your permission, I have about 45 minutes, <coughs> and there is so much to say about Fudu Farouk So I thought, uh, what are some of the most important things about her? For me, I think Furo Farouk told the truth. That's why the title of my talk is The Truth-Telling Project of Furo Farouk And, you know, since Zoroaster, we've been talking about telling <coughs> the truth. Uh, some of my most favorite poets and writers have had this as their motto. They've been expanding the boundaries of knowledge. They have been breaking taboos. They have been telling the truth. So Furu Farouk Saad, in letters, in interviews, in different poems, kept saying, I cannot lie. And she did not. You know, she was the first person to admit that as a human being, she is flawed, that occasionally she has committed even sins, and in a minute we will talk about that, but that she aspired, she wanted to be honest, to be truthful, um, not to give falsehoods. Furu Farouk believed that telling the truth is her obligation. She also thought that hearing the truth is the right of her readers. Of course, um, many uh, writers, many philosophers, many poets have talked about the significance of truth-telling. But truth-telling, especially for a woman in a society like Iran, where the relationship between literature and womanhood has been more complicated than perhaps in some other cultures, um, has been um, emphasized all over the world. So uh, Adrian Rich, uh, another favorite poet of mine, says that when a woman tells the truth, she's creating the possibility of more truth around her. And it is absolutely true. Furu uh, Farouk Saad broke many taboos. Some of them, even 50 years, 51 years after her death, remain taboos. Uh, I have just recently published uh, the literary biography of Furu Farouk Saad, a, a book I have proudly worked on for 39 years. But some of the issues, I published 15 of her unpublished letters. These are love letters to uh, a man she loved for the last eight years of her life. I can't tell you the number of articles mm. written about why publish the love letters of a woman to a man. This is a woman who has written the most beautiful love poems in the history of Persian literature. And I have to tell you, we have a glorious literary tradition in Iran. She wrote it and she published that. Everybody knew about that relationship. But 51 years later, we're still discussing whether or not the publication of these letters 
uh, were the right thing to do or not. So, um, and, um, uh, Mary Yadra Kaiser, a fantastic poet, says, what would happen if one, one woman, and I'm sorry, I have made a mistake, one woman, this is to prove that I'm a foreigner, <laughs> uh, told the truth about her life, the world will split up. And today, I want to argue with you that for Farouk Saad, by telling the truth, split open the world of Persian literature. And I want to argue with you the world of Iranian culture. So, um, I have divided my oh. uh, uh, my talk, um, hopefully in uh, five sections, and I will be able to talk to you uh, about these five um, different things. But I just wanted to read to you um, a poem. You know Furo Farrokhzad, as we discussed during the fantastic talk of my dear friend and colleague, um, about the relationship, perhaps, between <coughs> Khayyam and Farouk Farouk uh, One of the poets Farouk Zad has uh, quoted repeatedly is, in fact, Khayyam. Uh, she was barely 20 years old uh, when she wrote in an afterword to her first poetry collection, The Captive. You know, for those of you uh, who don't know Farouk Farouk Zad, let me just give you um, a brief synopsis of the body of her work. Um, she has published five poetry collections. The last one was, in fact, published posthumously. She has written a travel narrative, which is the first one by a woman uh, in Iran. Um, she has directed one of the best 10 documentaries in the history of the world. And this is not me claiming that. These are um, literary uh, film critiques. It's a short 22 minutes film about leprosy. Uh, it was filmed in a leprosarium. She actually went there and lived with these patients, lepers, for 12 days to make that film. I have interviewed some of the patients that were present when Farouk made her film there. And she kept saying, especially one of them, I love Farooq, I love Farooq. And I asked her, tell me, what is about her that you love so much? She said, I can't read any of her poems. She said, I have not even seen the film she has made of us. But I still love her. And when I asked why, she said, she is the only person who came to this leprosarium, who treated us like equals, mm. who did not treat us as patients, as lepers. And uh, the film is available on YouTube. If you have not seen it, may I suggest that please do watch that film. Um, it will make you look at disease and health differently, and beauty and ugliness in a completely different fashion. So you got already the gist of what's going to happen in the next 40 minutes. I'm going to have so many stories that I will end up not telling half of what I <laughs> want to tell. So to go back to Khayyam, in that introduction afterwards to captives, when she was barely 20, she says first that I have never felt the need to cover my face with a mask. And of course, to cover the truth with falsehood. And she didn't. And then she quotes this, uh, this quadrant from Khayyam. They say I am an old whiner, and it is true. They say I'm a drunkard, lecher, and it's true. But don't judge me by outward appearances. 
because I am true to my true self. Fulofan of Zod was not only true to her readers, she had this courage, which is to me the most difficult one, uh, to look herself in the mirror, to dust off the mirror of her soul time and again, to confront her flaws and to write about them. So, um, Telling the Truth, her truth-telling project, was not only about um, the events of her life, it was also about herself. So let's talk a little bit about her life. Um, I'm sure some of you know a lot about her life, uh, and I'm going to try to just give you a biographical sketch. We. Furu Farouzad is the most talked about Iranian, um, at least Iranian women. If you do a Google search, you will be surprised that you will find more entries on Furu Farouzad than you will find on Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi, <laughs> the king who ruled Iran for 37 years. Uh, she has become an icon. She's not only a literary figure anymore. She is really, she has crossed into a, a new um, level of importance. But we know not a lot about her life, although she's the most talked about women. And that's one reason for it, is because life narratives, at least in the Western sense of the word, are literary misfits in, in Iran and, if I may say, in the Islamic world. So um, to prove to you that her date of birth is not 1935, as we often think, that in fact she was born um, December 29, 1934. She was born in Tehran. Um, but she spent the first seven years of her life uh, in Noshak, a beautiful city by the Caspian Sea in the northern part of Iran. Her parents were unusual, um, iconoclast. Um, the father, um, Mr. Farrokhzad, his real name is actually not Farrokhzad. His name was Rezai. Um, but when he was in prison, and he was imprisoned a couple of times, including the day his daughter was born, his daughter Farouk was born, um, he, he loved poetry. I, I started by telling you about the love of Iranians with poetry, with literature. Uh, he came across the name Farouk in poetry books, and he changed his last name from Reza'i to uh, Farouk he came from Tafresh, uh, close to Tehran, um, the name of which originally was um, Arak, and then Arak. So his last name was Furude Farrokh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the father was Mr. Farrokh Zod. And if you see Farrokh Zod Araki, um, we don't know. Mm. We know her as Fadrosad, but her last name was Arabi, so Mr. Fadrosad changed that. Uh, he was a very complicated man. I will tell you a little bit more about him. But let me uh, tell you about the mother, Mrs. Fadrosad. Um, she, I had the great honor to talk to her repeatedly. Um, like her daughter, she was devoted to truth. She was very honest, sometimes even rude, you, you might say, in the Iranian context of courtesy and ta'aruf. Uh, she loved dolls. Um, she fell in love with um, her husband uh, when um, she was a young girl. Um, barely 16, 
Mr. Farrukhzad, at, at the time, was 11 years older. And the parents were totally opposed, especially her mother, uh, but they got married. In the first five years of their life, they had four children to get together. Uh, Puran, uh, Amir Mas'ud, Farooq, um, and uh, Feridun. Um, and then they moved from Noshar to Tehran, and they had another three. Uh, children, um, Mehran and Mehrdad and Kuli. Now, these are the, the four children. Uh, you see, she's, um, she's a very young woman with five, uh, four children, and then ultimately uh, seven. Um, when they returned to Tehran, Farooq uh, went to a mixed school, uh, that's before the revolution, when we had co-educational schools for a while. Um, and then, when um, Farooq's mother, uh, Turan Khanum, Turan Farooqsa, was pregnant with her seventh child, Mr. Farooqzad fell in love with Bahim Dukhte Darai. I have also interviewed her. We didn't know much about her, and uh, it was a miracle. It, it took me really almost a decade to find her. Um, and um, she was still, as you can see, a, a beauty, and uh, she was uh, a poet. The Farouzad family fell apart. Uh, that second marriage, and Farooq <coughs> fell in love with Mr. Shapur, uh, her neighbor, and also <coughs> her cousin. But we know from letters that have been published that she got married to him um, because she wanted to leave the house. She calls the house now a hell. So, uh, this is Mr. Shapur, um, you know, he was uh, um, an artist in his own right. Um, Ahmad Shamlu called him the karikalamaturist. He did uh, uh, caricature and words combined the two. Um, the couple um, moved to Ahfaz and uh, a year and a half their son, Kamyar, was born. Farooq was about uh, 21, and Kamyar um, was about two and a half, when Farooq Fadusad <coughs> started um, publishing her poetry, uh, first <coughs> in uh, literary magazines. And um, this is the first poem, the first important poem. There is actually one other short poem published before that. As you can see, um, there are two photographs of her. It starts with her name, um, if you read in Persian, Furu Farouzad. Um, and it's a 12-line 12, 12 poem. Uh, it's titled Sin. And it is probably, even to this day, the most anthologized poem of Furo Farasad. So let me just read a few lines of this uh, uh, poem um, to you. And um, to this day, Furo Farasad is still sometimes called Sha'ir um, Godin, uh, the poet who wrote Sin. Um, so it starts with I, which is already an unusual thing for a woman or for an Iranian writer to do. Um, as I said, because life narratives are literary misfits, definitely back then they were. So it starts with I. I sinned a sin full of pleasure. I sinned in arms, sturdy as iron, hot like fire, and vengeful. 
In that dark retreat of silence, I looked into his mysterious eyes. My heart trembled restlessly at the pleading in his eyes. In that dark retreat of silence, I sat by him, disheveled, distressed. He pressed his passion to my lips and freed my heart's aching shame. I poured all tales of love into his ears. I want you so much, oh dearest heart of mine. I want you to hold me close, oh love of my life. Oh you white lover of mine. I sin, a sin full of pleasure beside a body shuddering with passion. Oh, dear God, I don't know what I did in that dark retreat of silence. So a lot has been written about this poem. Um, in the glorious tradition of Persian literature, it's the first time that a woman with her name, two photographs instead of one, is admitting uh, to being in control of her life, of her body, of her love. She is the one who is uh, telling the tale of love. She is the one singing, I love you, in his ear. It's as if the roles have been reversed in a, in a way. The man is now the object of lust and desire. And um, there is a lot to be said about this poem. Um, it's definitely transgressive on many, many levels. But what I love the most about this poem was that this was published soon after the 1953 coup d'etat in Iran where all the fingers were growing taller and taller, blaming other people, the American government, the British government, this one and that one, and no one was willing to go that way and ask, what did I do wrong? So here's a woman who is beginning her poetry, her poem who is beginning her entrance into the literary arena by saying, he didn't seduce me. I'm the one who loved him. She's not seeking a partner in sin. She's admitting to um, having enjoyed what she calls a sin. Now, Adulterous women are dime a dozen in Persian literature. We have plenty of that. But this one is unrepentful. She does not commit suicide conveniently. She does not <laughs> die. She's not punished, at least not yet, and not in this book. And she's not the figment of a man's imagination. Mm -hmm. It's a woman talking about her personal desire, openly and with some plea in her words. Uh, soon after the publication of this poem, Farouk's um, first poetry collection uh, was published. Um, but something interesting had happened in the book. The most famous poem by Furu Farozad, Gona, Sin, was excised from Captive, that's the title of the first poetry collection, and the introduction was not written um, by um, anybody other than Shojoy Dine Shafa. Now, Sin was published in Roshan Fikr, a magazine. Uh, 
the editor in chief of that ma magazine is Mr. Nasser Khodayar. I have also interviewed him. Uh, fascinating few interviews. Um, he was the editor in chief, and uh, apparently, Farouk wrote the poem for him. He is the man with whom she committed the sin. So, soon after the publication of um, Captive, um, a serial was published, Pavaraki in Persian, was published in the exact same <coughs> magazine where Sin was published. It was called the um, Bruised Blossom. If you remember the photograph of Farouk mm -hmm. in, uh, in the earlier uh, Sin, um, she kind of looks like her. And indeed, it is a detailed, lurid detail of Mr. Uh, Nasser Khodayar's relationship with a woman who's not named Farouk Farouzad, but who is an artist who wants to be famous, who is using editors-in-chief to get to where she wants to get. And you can imagine. Um, we're talking about the 1950s in Iran. Now, with the publication of the sin, the parent, the mud, the father, and the husband were mad enough, and now we have this serialized humiliation of a father and a husband, and they are furious. Uh, Farouk um, um, gets deeply depressed attempt suicide, and is taken to Reza'i Psychiatric Hospital. Um, at the time, um, she was given electric shock therapy uh, without the administration of anesthesia. We don't know exactly how long she stayed there. It's definitely at least between a month and three months. And um, she, um, uh, after she leaves the hospital, uh, she gets a divorce uh, from Mr. Shapur. Uh, the first um, consensus, uh, census in Iran was taken in 1956. At the time, only 4%, 4% of all marriages in Tehran, where we had now the statistics, ended in divorce, 4%. So that tells you it was not um, something very usual. It was an unusual event. And according to the law, uh, Farouzad uh, lost the custody of her child. And soon, she was denied even sporadic visitation rights with her one and only adoptive child. I'm sorry, biological child. She did adopt a child from the leprosarium, Hussein Mansouri, um, who now lives in Germany. Um, after um, 14 months, Farouk comes back to Iran uh, from Italy and then Germany. Um, well, maybe I should have first told you that she left. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, she did leave because it was too much for her to bear, the rumors, and uh, it was just too much. She, she left, um, and uh, after 14 months, in fact, Mr. Farouk said the father didn't want her to come back yet, but she, um, she, she said she, she can't live without the Persian language. She needed to go back to, to Iran. She came back, and she needed a job. You know, the famous sentence uh, of uh, Virginia Woolf, uh, she needed a room of her own, uh, and she needed some money. And uh, of course, no, we love poetry, uh, we love literature, but especially in modern times, no Iranian uh, literary figure has been able to live 
uh, on her hair or his back. So she needed a job and um, she uh, started working as a receptionist uh, um, in a film studio by Mr. Golestan. Um, he is truly a unique, this is a more recent picture of him, uh, a cinematographer, uh, short story writer, um, really uh, a unique uh, and amazing man in his own right. And um, the two fell in love very quickly. And um, for the next eight years, um, they had uh, a very intense, at times tumultuous relationship. Um, Mr. Golestan was 11 years older than Farouk Farouksar, and um, they had many similarities and dissimilarities, and I don't think we'll have time to uh, go into that. Um, but that arrived uh, unannounced, as it often does, uh, unexpected, in a car accident. Uh, Farouk was at the height of her uh, creativity, uh, at the height of her career, uh, when she died in a car accident at the age of 32. Uh, the death of her body, in a way, uh, was a rebirth for her. Uh, it was soon after that that she became an icon. Um, in 1979, soon after the Islamic Revolution, um, Furu Farouk was banned. Um, in fact, uh, the publisher, uh, Amir Kabir, that had published her poems, uh, was burned down. Uh, and for a while, um, she was banned. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, the Islamic Republic, I don't think, learned the lesson from what they did with Salman Rushdie. Um, I, I'm not saying that's the reason why she's so popular. What I'm saying is that you can imprison people. You cannot put messages and you cannot put ideas behind what bars. You cannot incarcerate them. Um, they circulate. They have their own way of going places, of traveling. So um, now, uh, Farouk Zouad is available, um, although um, all her five poetry collections are censored. Uh, and in a minute, I will tell you uh, which are the poems or the lines uh, that are the most excised, which is fascinating, which is really interesting. So I want to take a few minutes um, to um, talk about how much more time do I have? Uh, you have as long as you want because our <laughs> uh, our afternoon program is very r relaxed. You know, we can start whenever we want. So you can go on and on and on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Seriously. Shahrzad. We, uh, we got you here. We want to go and hear every have word. We <laughs> want to hear every word you have to say. So keep going. Okay. So I'm going to try not to take, to exploit your ears too much. No, no. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about a um, few things, few other things uh, of Farouk Zouad that I find absolutely unique and important. I have called Furu Farouk Zouad the Iranian Icarus. Uh, you probably know Icarus. Uh, uh, I won't go into the details, but it's... Uh, it's the guy who loved the sun, was in love with uh, the sun, and uh, had a meeting with the sun, and of course we know went down to that. Um, there's been diff there are different paintings of him, and there are different poems about him, but one thing is sure. He paid a high price, but he did what he wanted to do. He wanted to meet with the sun, and he did. So Farouk is also the Iranian Icarus. She paid a very high price. 
for doing what she did. Um, I mean, Iranian women writers in the contemporary period um, have died young, have had several suicide attempts, successful suicides, incarceration, exile, you name it. And, and Furu Farouzad uh, attempted suicide five times and um, had um, periods of a week to two weeks of deep depression. Uh, but she also has produced this uh, amazing um, body of work, be it poetry or film, um, that um, is eternal. So um, the reason I call Farosad the Iranian Icarus is not only because of her love of sun and flying. It is because the story of Icarus has always fascinated me because it is both about captivity and flight. You know, the father was, of course, one of the first prisoners and the rest of it. So the body of women writers in Iran. And you know, we've had Iranian women writers from the very beginning of Persian literature. That goes uh, back to more than a thousand years. There's always been Iranian women, especially poets. Poetry has been a very woman-friendly genre of uh, art in Iran. But it is only from the, begin from the middle of the 19th century when we started having a literary tradition where we can start talking about a lineage, women who can refer to previous women, women who can refer to works of other women, uh, and even if they don't refer, who've been impacted in one way or another by these women. Um, if there is one thing in this 170 years of literary tradition, it is the juxtaposition of captivity and flight. And I love this painting because it has both, you know, all the birds flying and, of course, the chain and, and captivity. Now, why? Because freedom of movement is at the core of sex segregation. Um, I don't believe Islam wanted women segregated. But for centuries, women in Iran were segregated. What does that mean? It means that other than divides based on class, based on ethnicity, based on religion, there was another <coughs> divide of the social order, one based merely on anatomy, on your gender, on whether you are a man or a woman. Traditionally, the outside world was the world of men. The inside was the world of women. That's ideal femininity. Ideal femininity in Iran, we have expressions of as a, a woman who was not glimpsed even by the sun or the moon. Of the matter of Nadide. Um, so, when you deny half your population of their freedom of movement to go places, you're denying them access to power, you're denying them political presentation, you're denying them leisure, which is necessary to being a good writer, you're denying them access to the interpretation of their scripture, and we know these things are important. Uh, labor force, economic rights, education. Islam was a religion that granted women economic rights almost 14 centuries ago. And yet segregation, lack of freedom of movement, denied women their full access to a right granted them 14 centuries ago. 
Now, I'm going to put this in a global context. My field is comparative literature. I would be amiss not to tell you that this is not the monopoly of Iran or of Islam. Let me give you one example, the notion of beauty. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? The question and look at the answer. Look at this. What is this? The mirror, of, what is the name of it? The mirror of Venus, right? <laughs> and what is this one? The weapons of Mars. This is the sign of feminine, of womanhood, women. This one of masculinity uh, uh, for men. Not only in Iran, everywhere, in most everywhere. I'm talking symbolically, I know it's much more complicated than that. But look at this. The woman is a prisoner of a handheld mirror, but she's also held in place. She cannot move. Look at the map. The sky is the limit. It's an arrow soaring towards the sky. Can go anywhere he wants. The woman. You know, think about it. I said this is symbolic. But Iran is called the land of the rose and the nightingale. Why is it that gol is always feminine in Iranian literature and bolbol is always masculine? Don't bolbol have feminine uh, uh, also? Don't they have female? Uh, Nightingales. But in Persian literature, you know, one is stuck in place, the other one is the bird that can fly everywhere. What about the counter ideal woman? In all cultures, in overwhelming majority of the cultures we know, the witch. What is the quality of the witch other than being ugly and old and all that? Flies on a broomstick, the very sign and symbol of her femininity, transformed into a vehicle able to carry her to forbidden places. It's like bicycles. Susan B. Anthony said, nothing has helped the suffragette movement more than a bicycle. She's right. These are important things. Let me give you a few more examples, and I will then move on. Uh, foot binding in China. For thousands of years, women had their feet bound, literally mutilated, their bones broken down, so that they can have high heels made out of their bones and their muscles, so that they can have tiny little slippers. Which takes me to what? These slippers that cover these mutilated feet to Cinderella. What was the quality that took Cinderella from rags to riches? Her small feet. Her tiny little slippers. There are more than 600 different versions of Cinderella in the world. And they all have this one quality. They have tiny little feet. Um, you know, it's not only Cinderella. Look at the feet of Barbie, the icon of modern uh, beauty in the world. Um, look at the world literature. Whereas men <coughs> arrive galloping on their horses, Prince Charming's, world literature is filled with sleeping beauties and odalisks that don't move, and, um, and Snow White sleeping in her bed, surrounded by uh, munchkins and these. Um, I can go on for, uh, for hours about it. I teach a course called From Cinderella to Barbie, women and beauty cross-culturally, we only discussed that. How immobilizing women, 
how denying women their freedom of movement is um, a cross-cultural phenomenon. So um, let me uh, give you a few examples of um, how this um, manifests itself uh, in the poetry of Fado. So uh, I don't have time to read you. I have a few poems that I wanted to share with you, but um, I'm just going to tell you about them. Um, in one of her most famous, most anthologized poems, uh, Only the Voice Remains, or It's Only the Voice That Remains, um, in 60 lines, Farouk Zod asks six times, why should I stop? And you know, uh, images of flight, images of birds, the desire to be free and unfettered is definitely a central, central metaphor in Farouk's poetry. And I want to end with another theme that I think um, is central to Farouk's poetry. And that is what she believed um, should happen in order for democracy to uh, rule in a country. Farouk Zad, from early on, when she started to write, when she was barely 20, she questioned the traditional family in Iran. Um, you have watched the film by Asghari Farhadi, um, Separation. See, I, um, you know, I think a thesis is to be written soon by the similarities between Asghar Farhadi and Furu Farosa. Uh, they both deal with family, and they both discuss the death of patriarch, the patriarch in its traditional sense. Uh, they talk about a crisis of masculinity in Iran each in their own special way. But Farouk Saad, from early on, in her first poetry collection to her very last, questioned traditional families. In one of her most anthologized poems, The Conquest of the Garden, a beautiful poem where it starts on Kalori ki pari das faroz sarama wa furu raf daram dishe ashufte apri belgar so uh, a crow is flying over the head of two lovers, and it will take the news of this relationship to town. But she says, um, you and I, the poem is always you and I, you and I looked through that door to the uh, apple, to the garden. We uh, we saw the garden and the apple, and we picked the apple. Everybody's scared, everybody's scared, but you and I are not scared. We join the water, the lamp, which is a uh, symbol of marriage without a marriage license. Though. And, and um, in this story, in this beautiful poem, as you probably have thought about it already. She revives and then revises the creation story, right? There is an Adam and Eve, there is the garden, there is the apple. But if in the original story, picking the apple and knowledge was cause for expulsion, in this poem, it's the reverse. They see the apple love and lust and shared commitment <coughs> is the passport for their entry to the garden. And the poem is truly one of the most revolutionary, one of the most beautiful poems of Persian literature. But towards the end of her life, especially in the posthumous poem, there is another poem. Um, called um, I Feel Sorry for the Garden. 
which is again about a family. Uh, and we know it's her own family, uh, symbol of all the families in Iran. Um, the father, so there is a garden, uh, a withering garden. And the poet tells us that he feel, she feels sorry for the garden. Says, My father reads Shahnameh and Nasakh Tabarik, two historic um, epic poem, one of them, a history book, but basking in past glories of Iran. So he's not doing anything. He's just basking in old glories. My mother, she says, is always at her prayer rug. She's constantly praying for the flowers and for the garden, but she too is not doing anything. She's not taking full responsibility. The brother, who is a philosopher, constantly drinking and takes his anger, his frustration, to a place called a bar. So he drinks away instead of taking action. And the sister is so infatuated with appearances that every time she visits, the garden and witnesses the poverty of the garden, she uses perfume. She covers up um, the uh, poverty of the garden. <coughs> and then the poet enters the poem and she says, but death and destruction should not be the lot, the end of this garden. I know we can take this garden to hospital. Then she says, I know it, I know it, I know it. I think like many other women writers in Iran who have been at the forefront of a third revolution in Iran, I've been talking about a third revolution in Iran for almost 15 years. I believe, other than the constitutional revolution of 1905, 1911, other than the revolution of 1979, a third revolution is happening in Iran. It's a revolution that is non-violent. It's a revolution that is um, that revolves around gender relations. It's a revolution that has women writers and poets, and it's at its forefront. These women have been fighting for the last 170 years for desegregation, for democracy, for the right of the individual, male and female. They have always believed that if there is injustice in a society, both men and women are denied their full humanity. I salute them, and I thank you for listening. Thank you.